Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from Mark 3, verses 20 and 21, and 31 through 35 is entitled, Jesus Accused by His Family and by Teachers of the Law. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. May God add his blessings to this reading of his holy word. I had a very uh, normal upbringing, uh, other than the fact that my dad was a minister. Um, that, that's not the joke. Um, I, I had a pretty normal childhood, a pretty normal family. We did rather normal things. Um, and then when I met Angie and uh, we started dating, I met Angie's family. Not that it has anything to do with it, but Angie's family is Italian. Um, you know how every family has sort of that weird uncle? Yeah, I, I didn't have any weird uncles. I had three uncles, uh, but none of them were odd. Um, Angie had, you know, at least four weird uncles. <laughs> In Jesus' day, uh, family was extremely important even more so than it is for us today. Family often lived in the same village, often in the same house. Uh, we know that that can happen today, that we can all be in the same town or in the same city, but uh, it is much more common today for family to be, you know, in Vancouver and Calgary and in the United States or over in Europe or Asia uh, and spread out much more. In Jesus' day, in Jesus' culture, family not only lived close together most of the time, they operated a family business together, whether that was their farm or a, a fishing uh, industry or um, making clothing or, or who knows what. Your family knew you extremely well. And we have here Jesus being raised by his parents. After a while, we stopped hearing about Joseph, so we assume that he may have died uh, uh, before Jesus began his ministry. And then about the age 30, Jesus is baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River. He goes out into the wilderness where he's tempted by, the sat by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. And he comes back and he has a ministry. He begins to go from town to town explaining and proclaiming that the good news of his heavenly father is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he begins healing people, healing the blind, the lame, the sick, even raising the dead. He begins proclaiming what the kingdom of his heavenly father is like, and who is included and who is not included. And the people that you thought were excluded, they're included. And the people that you thought were for sure in are not necessarily included. And the crowds are coming to him in swarms to hear his teaching, to witness his miracles, perhaps to be healed themselves or bringing family members to be healed. And Jesus is busy. He is a man in demand. His family grow concerned about him. They're hearing rumors. They're hearing stories. They, they know he's traveling and working so hard. They know that there's a ruckus that he's doing things and saying things which are rubbing some people the wrong way. And so, like any good family, they're concerned about him. And so they hear that he's in Capernaum, about 25 miles away. And so Mary, his mother, and some of his brothers go that 25 miles 
to find him, to, to rescue him, to perhaps encourage him to come home for a while and, and go to bed, to, to have a rest, to, to just sort of regroup and regather and, and to think through maybe a little more clearly what he is doing. They perhaps don't have a good handle on who he is and what he's doing. And so they arrive at the house where Jesus is surrounded by a crowd. Are you, are you Jesus' mother? Uh, is that your family with you? Just a second. Let me, let me go get him for you. Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here for you. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister, and my mother. Very interesting response that Jesus has. He says, whoever does God's will is his brother or sister or mother. What does Jesus mean by God's, <clears throat> God's will? Is he referring simply to the Ten Commandments? Is he talking about the law, the Jewish law, the religious law? Is he talking about what he's teaching the crowds in his parables? What does he mean by everyone who does God's will? Well, last night we had just finished supper and the phone rang. It was Ramon, one of our Syrian friends, Lulu's uncle. He said that Lulu had just passed away and the family, not being familiar with Canadian funeral practices, they had some questions for me about the service. They would be going to the funeral home this morning to make the arrangements. And so we talked for a bit on the phone, and then Ramon asked if I would be able to come over and see the family tonight, last night. I hadn't finished my sermon yet for school. And so I was like, oh... I, I would really like to. I, I don't know if I can. And so when I called him back a little while later to let him know about the availability of the church for the, the service, I changed my mind. Um, I was like, yeah, I, I have to go. Um, this, being there for them, supporting them, uh, is more important than this sermon for school. Um, and so I went. That, to me was doing the will of God. When you're, you know, using your snowblower and you know that your neighbor is elderly and isn't able to do that very well for themselves, when you blow off or shovel their driveway for them, that is you doing the will of God, acting in love, sacrificial love, putting others ahead of your own comforts, your own preferences. When a family member phones and says, can you babysit for me tomorrow? You may be like, oh, no, I'd rather not. But when you say yes, you're doing the will of God. When a neighbor, or, or I should say a stranger, stops you and says, can I borrow your cell phone? I, I've lost mine, or uh, I don't have one, and I need to call. You know, if you're able to trust them enough to allow them to place that call, you are doing the will of God. Jesus says that everyone who does the will of God is his brother or his sister or his mother. So if I'm doing the will of God and you're doing the will of God, then I'm Jesus' brother and you're Jesus' sister and so that makes us brother and sister. It applies even to the people in the balcony. <laughs> if we're all brothers and sisters of Jesus because we're doing or trying to do God's will, that makes us family. Now, just as we can't choose our biological family, we can't choose what family we're born into and how many crazy uncles we have, we also can't choose our church family. All of us 
are going through different things. We've come from different places, different experiences, different backgrounds. We have our own understandings, our own practices, our own uh, uh, ways that we're growing in our faith and in our Christian understanding and our, our desire to live into the will of God for ourselves and for our church family. All of us are different. And we need to be willing to embrace those differences, accept those differences. Some people, they want a perfect church. Perfect. Where they, you know, there's no conflict, there's no financial concerns, you know, they, they love every piece of music that ever gets sung or played. There isn't a whole lot of work to do. Perfect church. There's no such thing. I, there was some laughter there, because some of you realize there's no such thing as a perfect church, not on earth anyway. There is in heaven, but not here. And so we need to stop trying to find one. Because I know I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. And so whatever church I'm in is not going to be a perfect church. My condolences. <laughs> Some people think that, that churches are full of hypocrites, that, that Christians say that, that they're perfect or that they're good when in fact Christians realize that they're not perfect <laughs> and they're not always good either. We confess that and we receive the grace of God and we give thanks and praise to God for the fact that he loves us anyway, despite the fact that we're not perfect. He forgives us and continues to call us to be his child, to be in his family, to be sisters and brothers with one another. How sad it is when someone will come to me and say, I, I, I have to leave the church. There's a person here that I just can't stand. They keep sitting in my seat. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but only to a point. Because people have come and said, I, I can't worship here anymore because of so-and-so. And how sad that is. Jesus calls us sisters and brothers. And we know that one aspect of God's will for us is that we be family. That we work together, worship together, grow together. Now some people are saying that, you know, I don't like organized religion. Well, I think I understand where they're coming from. Back a hundred years ago, churches began to operate more like businesses. They developed a lot of structure, a lot of policies, a lot of rules, a lot of expectations, and, and it, the church became very business-like, but perhaps their financial approach to things as well. And people can see that that seems a little far removed from the people that Jesus calls us to be. So I can understand when people say that they don't like organized religion. Now, I'm sure most of us recently had, <clears throat> had a, a family Christmas. When you do something like that, it takes some organization, doesn't it? You have to decide who's going to host this dinner, this gathering this year. And whoever is going to be hosting is going to have to make some decisions that the rest of the family isn't going to be in on. How they arrange the tables and chairs, you know, you have to agree upon what time you're going to gather, you have to agree who's going to bring what dish, it takes some organization. You have to agree who's going to pick up Nana from the retirement home, who's going to take her back again, right? The church is not an organized religion. We are an organized family. Can you imagine what it would be like if we were unorganized, right? We'd show up at all different times on a, a Sunday for worship, or maybe some of us would show up on other days of the week. We wouldn't have any teams or, or do much. We wouldn't get much done. We wouldn't have much uh, ways to, to connect and grow and serve together. If everybody was just doing their own thing, we can't do that with a family. Why do we think we can do it when it comes to our Christian church and our church family. 
We are an organized family doing the will of God. Now, some people say, I can be a good person without going to church. And maybe that's true. I'm sure that there are lots of good people, honest people, loving, caring, generous people who don't go to church. But I ask you this, are they intentional about trying to understand God's will for their lives? Are they daily seeking to understand who God is, what his will is, to live into that will, just as Jesus says, everyone who does the will of God is my sister or my brother? Are they intentional about growing in their relationship with God? Maybe a few of them are. But I would say it's a lot harder to do that on your own than it is as a part of a family. How many of you belong to a gym? Yeah. Now, you could buy some equipment and do that in your own house, but there's an advantage to belonging to a gym. When you go, you get to know other people. You can not just exercise and become more physically fit, you can have a a social relationship. You may even begin to encourage one another in your exercise, in your diet, and in other ways as well. You can talk about your, your families, you can get to know each other, become friends. How many of you go walking for exercise? Yeah. How many of you walk with somebody else, if you can, instead of walking alone? Yeah, same principle. It's a much uh, better for me. I can, I can only speak for myself. I would much ra- I would never go for a walk by myself. Um, but, you know, unless it's like upstairs to get some chocolate or something. Um, <laughs> but I don't mind going for a walk with somebody else. It 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 just it's something else to do rather than just walk and be alone. You can talk, you can get to know each other, you can discuss things, uh, and there's a fellowship there that just doesn't happen when you're by yourself. And it's the same being a part of a church family. There are so many blessings and benefits when we're a part of a church family, despite some crazy uncles and aunts. It gives us the opportunity to connect with one another, to connect better with God, to, to grow together to grow in our Christian faith and our understanding, to serve better together. Think how poorly we would do if we went out to try to serve without that being organized, right? As a church, if we were all just doing our own thing, trying to serve, we wouldn't have our food bank. We wouldn't have brought over 25 Syrian refugees. We wouldn't uh, be serving Delta's church. We wouldn't be doing a hundred different things if we weren't organized. But by being family, trying to do the will of God, we can accomplish so much. How beautiful that is. And we are doing so much. I am thankful, joyful, that you are my sisters and brothers. I am thankful that Jesus has said to me and to you, if you do my Father's will, you are my brother, my sister, my mother. Jesus says that to our friends at L'Arche. Jesus says that to our small groups. Jesus says that to our ministry teams and our leadership teams. You are my brothers and sisters, and we are family together. I am so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. Thank you for being my sister and my brother. Alleluia and amen.